winter. The branches of leafless trees contrasting the greys and browns that are so often associated with the woods at this time of year. The cold morning frosts bring silence and peace to the forest. The air is crisp, fresh, and the ground gives a distinctive crunch when walked on. With the woodland becoming dormant in the winter, there are a number of jobs that are ideally suited to the colder months. A huge part of my channel has been to practice the traditional crafts of Britain. We are steeped in history, and sadly, many traditional woodland crafts and skills have been forgotten. But they are slowly making a comeback. I want to try and help to revitalise these ancient skills, to bring back some of the ways of the woodsmen of old. And by doing this, I hope to be able to inspire many of you to do the same, to pass on that knowledge so that it is not forgotten. And so, for this episode, I will base it on the traditional craft of hedge laying. And I don't just mean trimming some bushes to make a tidy boundary. I mean the art of partially cutting a tree, folding it over and creating a long lasting living hedge that grows and flourishes year on year. Creating a brand new wildlife habitat that would not have existed in this particular area before. I'm talking about a skill that is thousands of years old and first documented in 57 BC by the Roman leader Julius Caesar. His report on the Nervi tribe described how the tribe made hedges by cutting and laying down small trees and then binding them together with brambles and thorn to provide a stop-proof barrier to keep their livestock safe from the raiders of other local tribes. Hedge laying continued on throughout history, but a dramatic change occurred in the 20th century. The onset of World War II meant that there was a drive to increase farming output to feed an already growing nation but also to clear fields and hedgerows for airfields for the wartime effort. With the tractor now replacing horses in the farming industry, this meant that bigger fields were required for the machinery to work effectively, and thus the widespread removal of hedges began. It wasn't until the 70s and 80s that studies revealed how damaging the removal of hedges has been to nature and wildlife conservation, and so there is now a drive in the 21st century to restore traditional hedgerows and increase the habitat areas that were otherwise just open field. My priority for this time of year is to tidy up my boundary that divides the woodland from the fields. Boundaries are a touchy subject for many, but they are a very important part of owning a woodland. The boundary in which the woodland meets the field is only separated by a dilapidated barbed wire fence, most of which had been buried underground after being left unmanaged for many years. And so our first job was to find this barbed wire fence, some of which still remained intact, and pull it up from the ground, tracing it back to where it originally stood on the trees at the edge of the woodland. Now I really dislike barbed wire fencing. It's dated, it looks ugly, and it's a nuisance to work with. However, this tired looking barbed wire fence is the official legal boundary that separates my woodland from the field. It is written in the deeds as this, and so it is that this barbed wire fence must remain as the fencing boundary. I was fortunate enough to bump into the owner of the field on one of my days working in the woods. And so I used this opportunity to walk the entire boundary with the owner to show where the fence was laying and that the trees on the woodland side of the fence were owned by me. The owner of the field explained that the boundary had not been managed for many years and there were many overhanging branches encroaching in the field. And so we agreed that I would help to clear these branches, keep the barbed wire fence and create a natural, long lasting living hedge by part felling some of the small boundary trees. And so we begin our journey into traditional hedge laying, a bushcraft skill that dates back thousands of years. 
By creating a living hedge, I am not only helping to tidy up the otherwise neglected border between my woodland and the field, but I am also helping to create a whole new habitat for birds and mammals. It's an ideal job to do in winter, because the small birds are not quite nesting yet, but more importantly, the tree sap is not rising, and so the trees have time to grow new shoots over the coming year. So what exactly is hedge laying? In simple terms, it is the art of putting a thin cut into the trunk of a small tree, and then folding it over at roughly a 30 degree angle, and sawing off the remaining heel to prevent buildup of leaves and water in the joint. By leaving this small thin slice of tree connected to the stump, it allows the tree to continue to grow. The outer bark of the tree is the protective layer or skin, and then directly underneath this is the phloem. This is the inner bark layer, which allows nutrients to be carried up and down the tree, depending on the time of year. The next layer underneath the phloem is the xylem layer. This is the soft sapwood, which carries water through the tree trunk. Between the phloem and the xylem is the vascular cambium layer, which is soft cell tissue that utilises both water and plant sugars provided by this phloem and xylem and helps to form the new plant growth cells. Therefore, this whole process of hedge laying involves cutting the tree thin enough to fold it over, but leaving enough of the cambium layer remaining to help the water and nutrients flow up and down the tree and encourage new growth. If the contact between the tree and the stump is broken, then the tree will die and no longer produce new growth. There are a number of terms used in hedge laying. Pleaching is the actual tree that is to be cut and laid down. Laying is the process of laying the partially cut tree. Binders are the long thin hazel rods used to weave in and out of the stakes to secure them tight. And a bill hook is the tool used for cutting and trimming hedges. So here is kind of a perfect example really of how hedge laying works and how the regrowth works. You can see that this hazel here covered in moss has actually been down quite a while. It's not been cut with a bill hook or anything like that. It's actually just fallen over in the wind and it's continued, it's kind of stopped growing that way and it's sent up these vertical shoots here which are obviously following the sunlight. But it's a great example of how the hazel tree works uh, and any kind of hedgerow tree, blackthorn, hawthorn, things like that. How it would work once you've done the pleaching and you've done that cut, you fold it over and as long as there's sap that can run through that cambium layer and you keep that bark rigid still, it will allow all those nutrients to go to the plant and then all the buds that are dormant inside will be get inside the, the, the kind of trunk of the bark will begin to grow upwards as branches and that way you then have your living hedge. This is an example, sadly, this one where you can see has come right into the farmer's border here and we're clearing as we go to make it nice and easy for the farmer and myself to see a very clear border. They get their sort of farmland back from where my trees have been encroaching on them and I get the trees and the dead wood and the resources, the brush as such, to then lay a dead hedge as well to uh, encourage wildlife habitat for small birds and mammals and things like that. So it's really a win-win for both parties. And um, yeah, Dad's just working away up there and we're just going along, this is the northern border here, hence why probably there's quite a bit more of moss on the trees. And we're just working our way, clearing all the branches as we go around about sort of head height. It's tiring work, but it's great work for winter when it's cold.
So I've made basically the pleach cuts here. Now I did this with a saw, so it's quite a bit less tidy than what it would be with the bill hook. I'll use the bill hook in a minute and just show you the technique I use for that. But I've tidied off, this would have had the vertical bit there left on the stump and I've just tidied that off so that that is nice and smooth. And as you can see, there's just a thin layer of outer bark and the cambium layer of the, the, the hazel here to allow those uh, to allow water to pass up and down and sap and nutrients to pass up and down back into the root system of the tree so essentially its life support is still there because of this small thin layer that has been still attached so that is essentially that's the key to hedge laying is making that pleach cut but not going directly through the tree because that cuts off the supply just keeping enough to allow that those nutrients, minerals, water, sap to flow back and forward up into the tree. And that way along this horizontal section here, it will start to shoot, vertical shoots will start to come up within, well, next year really, they'll start to shoot up. And remember, under this entire layer of bark, up at, all the way up the tree, are sort of hidden buds that most of the time when a tree's growing won't actually come out and form into branches, only a few do. But when it's like this, it will start to encourage those ones to go. These ones below are a little bit flatter than 30 degrees, and that's just because of the weight of them. I probably should have propped them up a little bit more. The other thing with doing this method of hedge laying is that if there is a slope, you need to be pointing the trees uphill, and that just allows the sap to flow a lot better. The sap doesn't like to be flowing downhill. So it's important to try and make sure that they are flowing uphill. Sometimes you won't always have that luxury, but it does make it work a lot better and a lot more efficiently. So ideal angle around about 30 degrees. This one here is not far off it. And um, that way all that sap can still flow and those new shoots can come up nice and easily. So I've got a few more I could probably lay here. I mean, that one I might lay. Thing is, is I've got this big old ash stump behind me. So there's not too much laying that can go on there. But there's already coming from this stool here, some whippy hazel shoots, which is great because that's gonna help fill out the upper end of the hedge. So now I've got to start to put in some vertical stakes and that will help to bind and keep these all together in, in any strong winds. Once the trees have been cut and laid over, I then needed to cut some hazel to make stakes and binders. These will help to keep the cut trees secure and prevent them from rocking and potentially breaking off in strong winds. So you can use a sledgehammer. I've got a sledgehammer with me, but to, to begin with the ground's so soft, I'm just gonna use a stick that's got a nice solid knot there as a bashing stick. Traditionally, they would use things called a beetle, which again has a long, kind of thin handle and it's a big knotted piece of wood at the end. So all the weight's at the end and you can drive that stake in. But again, you can use what's around you or you can bring tools in. These are the stakes. Some are a bit too thick, but ideally, they're gonna go in between these and sort of in and out and then pull it tight like that. Keep it vertical and then I can drive it in. And that's just gonna keep these from rolling to the side. So traditionally, uh, with the stakes and the spacing of the stakes, you would do it from your fingertips to your elbow as a gap, just as a gauge. So fingertips, elbow, and that would be the next stake roughly there. Making sure I'm pulling it all tight and keeping it straight, there you go. going to work these stakes in well until I get to the next section of trees that I've pleached and laid down and then, I, and then we're going to work on a binding on the top 
So just the other side of this barbed wire here is really the ideal diameter of hazel that I could use to weave as a binder, as a binder really, on the top of those stakes. That's a nice diameter and the one next to it's quite nice. They're growing nice and straight. So I think this would be ideal. And obviously by cutting them there, down low, this will create the stool that will eventually regenerate next year and it will start to shoot again. And that's one of the amazing things about hazel is the way that it regenerates and the speed at which it regenerates by cutting it right back to the base. There are a number of tools which have been created specifically for hedge laying. One of the most famous ones is the bill hook. They come in different styles. This one is a Southern Counties bill hook and probably the most common one with its single cutting edge blade and a curve at the end. There are larger bill hooks which can do bigger tasks, such as the Yorkshire bill hook, which has a cutting edge on both sides and a longer handle for two handed swinging. But you can also use a handsaw or even a chainsaw to make the cuts for bleachers. The short handled bill hook is ideal for trimming branches for the binders, and traditionally, when making the stakes, Often hedge layers will lay the stake across their thigh to use it as a support when putting points on the stakes. I make them about 5 foot in length and put a bevel on the end that will be knocked in. This helps to stop the stake from mushrooming out, although afterwards I will then bevel this stake at a steep 45 degree angle to ensure that the stake will shed water to prolong the life of it in the ground. Once the stakes are driven in, they need to be secured tight with what is called binders. Binders are simply long, thin rods of hazel, which can be interwoven with each other and the stakes, and then tapped down to give the hedge a firm and secure finish. Ideally, the rods for binding need to be at least eight foot long, and any protruding branches must be removed. To confuse things further, there's different ways of hedge laying, depending on the different regions in the UK that you're in, or the different counties. So I'm in the southern counties here, which is Hampshire, <clears throat> and uh, what I'm doing is kind of a mixture really of like, a, I guess, a midland style hedge laying and, and a southern counties one. But obviously up, up north, uh, the species are slightly different, the variety of hedge laying species that you get up there. So they utilise a different technique. Hampshire, I believe, normally have the brush, the kind of offcuts of the hedge on both sides of the fence area, the kind of wattled area. So where you've laid down those trees, what we've done here is we've put the brush, the cut up stuff, that side of the hedge, my woodland side of the hedge, and we're leaving the farmer's field side free so that they, just so that they can clearly see the boundary. It's something we talk to them about. And obviously I'm working with barbed wire here as well. Normally that is done when the same farmer or adjacent farmers have fields next to each other. So it's kind of field, hedge, field. Obviously here it's field, woodland, not field to field. So I don't feel the need to put the brush on both sides of the, of the fence here. So I'm just gonna use two sticks to begin with at the top of the binding, each either side of the stake, and then I'm gonna weave them in and out, kind of like I've done before on my channel with the medieval fence building and just weave them in and out and that's going to bind together and as I knock those down these stakes are all going to go a lot more rigid and um, you can put them at an angle just to make them a bit more secure when they're pulled in they'll go a lot more rigid and then that will help the hedge to establish and last for a lot longer so let's start weaving it's a bit tricky at first because you've got to go one one side one the other side that one that side And that's my basic weave. Now it doesn't look very pretty because I've not lined it yet, but I've also put, got a lot of dead hedge, messy material offcuts all underneath here. But once I hit this down, and that is the start of the binder. Now I can, I can add more binders in if I want to make it a bit more rigid. I might put one more thin layer on there. But essentially that is it. Now it doesn't look pretty, I get that. Obviously we've got the barbed wire, but that's important for the farmer. It's what we agreed on. They can see the barbed wire is the original boundary with the 
the original kind of trees you can see from this big stump here this would have been an original boundary tree and that's really going to be the start of the hedge like i said it doesn't look pretty really and, and hedges in general in winter don't tend to look too pretty but once that starts to send shoots up and that starts to bud and turn into leaves this will turn into a really quite a thick hedge and what i want to show you in a bit uh, later in this episode is what an established hedgerow looks like it will be winter it will be shot in winter but what it can look like and what the shoots will look like after a couple of years Sitting on our newly made bench. Yeah. Quickly done with a little chainsaw and, a, and an axe. It's a great thing now though, isn't it? We're kind of building, look, adding to this camp each time we come, even though we're not even doing camp stuff yet. We're doing the hedges. It's just nice to have something to sit on. It's bloody to do, yeah. And you do want to sit down and you make your own tables and everything later on. We are just saying how there's no wind today. Funny for the fire. It's weird, yeah. the fire's just not going properly, there's just no airflow. Don't want to know. What do you think of the um, the ancient hedging technique? You must have seen it, it's been done for hundreds of years, so you must yeah, have seen yeah, yeah. it when you were younger. They probably did it more when you were younger. Probably in the 50s and 60s after the Second World War. Yeah, exactly. There would have been a shortage of metal, I would imagine. And possibly timber. Mm. So you'd have to use, uh, use all your natural resources. Well, that actually, funny you say about the Second World War, the there was a, over 100,000 or hundreds of thousands of miles of hedge that was destroyed, dismantled or whatever, pretty much cut down during the Second World War because they needed the land for the crops to grow more food for the soldiers and for the civilians and things like that. So, so much hedgerow was destroyed in Britain and across Europe. Um, and it was actually after the Second World War that there were studies done that realized obviously this was really detrimental to nature to small mammals and birds mm. that they were like wow we need to we need to do something about this so there was actually then a flourish of hedge laying and farmers then split their fields up again um laying traditional you know growing the hedge and then laying it over like we've been doing so it's interesting how it's fluctuated up and down hedge laying and it's now making a bit more of a comeback hopefully through things like this where i do the videos and it hits yeah. a big audience and then you guys can watch and pass on that knowledge because that's what TA Outdoors is all about. That's what all we, and TA Fishing Dad's channel, that's what it's always been about, it's just passing the knowledge on. You know, we're not experts, we don't do hedge laying every day, but it's nice to be able to include this as part of my 
My Woodland series, really, isn't you, you it? You watched a, a, like a really black and white Yeah, there's a, there's a BBC. The guy was really good at it. There was a BBC, before the BBC, I think it was called Pathé, and uh, that was essentially what the BBC was. It was black and white stuff, and they still have it on YouTube and things. And I watched a video, I think it was 1920s or something, of a, a traditional hedge layer, and he was insane with the bill hook. It was unbelievable what he could do. I think he was using a Yorkshire bill hook. But it's there, he's there in all his tweed with his pipe and his hat. And I just thought, imagine that, yeah. trying to do hedge day with a, with a wall. With a pipe, it's bad wall. enough with the smoke from the yeah. fire. We're going around every, every third or fourth pace, we're going, ah, <laughs> smoke in the eyes. This is a renewable hedge. So essentially mm. you lay the hedge and really you don't have to do, it's hard work to begin with. It's a lot of maintenance and it's a lot of um, physical labour to begin with. But the idea is that hedge is now living and it will grow up and then you can chop, crop it back. It will grow up and it will cro you chop it back. And essentially you're creating this renewable hedge that is creating wildlife habitat. Mm. And you know, all those bits that you cut, cut off every couple of years, a couple of feet like that, you can then stuff underneath the hedge and it creates nesting areas for birds and things like that. So I've personally really enjoyed learning about it, doing yeah, it, absolutely. and I'll continue to do it down the edge of the woodland um, where it meets the field, so. After recharging That's with some warm food and coffee by the campfire, okay. we headed back off to continue hedge laying. This is a long process, and it's not a job that I would finish in a day. Although this part of hedge laying can be a lengthy task, once complete, it will need little maintenance in the long run. The hardest part is the actual laying of the hedge. Any further maintenance won't be needed until I trim the growing shoots in a few years time, once the hedge has been more established. thing I did want to show you is where I've made a pleacher here out of this hazel. You can see there's the thin bark layer left for the nutrients and things to flow in the sap. What you can do is this was leaning up against that tree stump and it was a little bit too high. You can actually make a second pleacher cut further down uh, and then it allows you to hinge it more and then you can keep that angle even further. So what was happening with this tree is it was coming up here a little bit too high, which means the hedge would have been starting to grow up here, that, you know, too high, and I would have kind of lost that lovely view. So what I've done is made another cut here, and that sap will still flow up all the way through from the first one, through down to this the second one here, and then into this tree here, and then it will be able to shoot more roots further down, say roots, sorry, um, branches. It will should throw some new shoots up further down. And that way the, the level of my hedge is a little bit lower. Otherwise, it would have been just a bit too high. So, little tip for you there.
So a little field trip for you guys. I'm not in the woods, obviously. I'm out here on a footpath and there's a field just to my left here. I just wanted to show you this hedge laying that has been done here. And you could probably see from the vertical shoots, it's far more established obviously than mine is because I've only just started it. This is what it could look like in a couple of years time with the right conditions. But I just want to show you the pleaching cuts and everything that's been made, the binders, and just the height of the shoots already. This is, like I say, probably two to three years old, maybe a bit more, four years old, some of them, but it's incredible already how much it's flourished just from being cut and folded over. And also some of the cuts are really not very neat and it's still growing. So it shows you how resilient these hedges and plants can be, even when axed away, chopped away, folded over, they still can manage to throw up new shoots. So let's take a closer look. So just to gauge how far this is going, it's going all the way to the corner there and it actually goes all the way down to the right on the path. But you can see here from the binders, there is a fence that size, but it goes all the way down there as well. And just look at the shoots. These trees, all, almost all of these vertical trees there have come up from laying that hedge down. They weren't growing there originally. I mean, that is incredible. This is an established hedge and this is the technique that's been used absolutely awesome here you can see look at the trees have been partially cut there you go there's the pleaching the big cut the slice down there and obviously look how mature this is now because that's colored off all split down here and even at the bottom of the stump where they've made that they've cut off that heel there there are still new shoots growing straight out from the stump this is also hazel as well there's the, there's the heel that's been cut flush. Mine are usually quite white because they've just been cut. This is years later. And here, look at all these vertical shoots. They're, they're about an inch thick and they go all the way up here. Still going, but this one here. All the way, that's now about seven, eight, potentially nine feet. We're just gonna take a look at this. Th these trees here, these are hazel. So for example, that one there, this one here, that's hazel. The pleaching cut has been made down there. This has been folded over. The xylem and phloem, cambium layer, all still intact there. If we just follow this one here, where my finger is, just follow it along. Look at that. There. That is a new shoot. Well, it's a couple of years old now. It goes all the way up there. And look how straight it grows. So you can create a resource from almost nothing from just laying over a tree. That is at least the thickness of my thumb. Obviously when this tree was vertical, it wasn't growing out. So this has come up as a new shoot, a couple of years old now, but as a new shoot when that tree was folded over. Look at that, easily eight foot long, lovely and straight. And you can almost grow your own resources like this. Look, here's another one, really straight. And there's next to it, there's an even smaller one, but look how close it's growing together. Again, it's still, it's a whip at the moment, but it's all living, it's all growing. It's absolutely awesome and this is the technique in action. Here you go, there's another one there coming up, winding its way up nice and straight. So you can create straight sticks from nothing. If you, This is traditionally how walking sticks are made. They would lay them over like this, either in a hedge or lay them over on the ground and they would let it grow thick enough to then, that would be your hook of the sort of walking stick handle. They can make them like that. Unbelievable. Nature is awesome. I'm going to trace it along even more. Look, here you go. This one is actually going uphill. So there's me saying, you know, the, the angle's obviously with 30 degrees. Sometimes you need to be quite strict on it. You don't really. Look at this bit. This one coming off there. As the tree's been cut, laid over, there's another one next to it. And it's growing up. Easily, probably 10 feet, some of these. Unbelievable. And here's another stool that's been cut, loads of leaves, loads of debris, so it doesn't matter too much with your cutting of the heel because new shoots can grow out of the stool as well. There. That is blooming awesome. There you go. There. Another, another couple there, thick, size of my thumb, all growing vertical. And that is now an established hedge. They've let it grow up and what they can do is just trim these back and all of this loose stuff that's trimmed from up here can be shoved and wheezed back into the hedge to make it thicker. So each time you're thickening this bottom part of the hedge and then you let it grow up again. Very, very awesome to see this being done properly. And I'm looking forward to doing it more at mine. Now they've, they've weaved theirs in a lot better than I have. 
with their binders here. Can you see that if I just focus there? They've done a lot more kind of binders, thicker binders. And you can see there's actually a vertical tree. That's a green tree here growing up next to the stake. And they've binded it in there to keep it all tight. It's really impressive. And this is what kind of gives me inspiration to continue this old traditional British technique. Well, it's used all across Europe, but very, very much still done here in Britain. Here's another great one, look. An actual tree, okay, that they've left that tree growing as it is, but part of it obviously had a shoot coming out to the side. Can you see it there? And they've just pleached, cut that, laid it over, and then it's shot up even more shoots. It's all along here, look. There's a little tiny shoot coming up there. Growing vertically. So, there's TA, TA field trip. Our little school lesson out. <laughs> that is hedge laying at its best. That's, that's really impressive. You can see here from the stakes, this is just one of the stakes, they cut it at roughly a 45 degree angle, not quite there, but so water hits there, runs off, doesn't rot the stake out, and this is solid. You know, I can barely wobble that, it's all bound in really tight. There's a closer look at some of the uh, cuts. Use probably a bill hook there, folded over years later. And even now we're still growing new shoots down there. Still new shoots. Really, really, really impressive. Look at this one here. Here's a good example. Folded over, just there, a couple of feet up, really thick, nice thick established hazel branch. Turning into a small tree. And there you go folks. Hedge laying. Hedge laying 101. A living hedge created from folding trees. Awesome. So as you can see, that's where we started a few days ago. I've come back and forth just for days here, half days there. Worked my way around it. The actual pleaching takes the longest part of clearing the branches and laying down the tree. That's the trickiest part. This bit is not so tricky, but it comes all the way down here, right to, and that's where I've got to there in the, in the corner. I've got to come round there. Uh, ideally this winter, I'd like to just finish up by the point of the woodland there. And then as it starts to turn south, that boundary I'm going to leave until next winter, just because I don't want to plow through all my hazel resources straight away. This winter it's going to allow another year's worth of growth. Those hazels can put another growth ring on, get a little bit bigger, and then next year I'll be able to carry on around the other corner and continue that boundary. But what I do need to do, what we have done, is cleared all this bushes, these thick bushes and trees and overhanging branches here. We've done that all the way around the other side and we've picked up the barbed wire again. I think I mentioned earlier in the video the barbed wire, I don't like it, trust me, I don't like it, I know lots of you don't, but it is basically the legal requirement because it is the part of the original fence that is in the deeds, which is essentially the kind of legal documents that comes with the sale of the woodland that are sometimes hundreds of years old. It is in the deeds that the barbed wire fence is needs to kind of stay, basically. It is, it's basically the original fence. Um, so, yeah, just maintained it, put it back up, Yes, I don't like the look of, it, look of it, but all these, when this starts growing through green hazel shoots and the bushes and it bushes out, we put all the twigs in there as well, the dead sticks, it'll eventually be a lovely little hedge. Um, and you will see, I've already seen birds starting to land in here. Um, I've not managed to get the footage, the camera ready quick enough yet, but hopefully over this next couple of months, I'll be able to get you more birds landing in here. Just to show you that I've created that habitat already and they're already coming over to it feeling a bit more confident, which is great. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Uh, that's probably it for this episode. I don't think I need to do any more hedge laying for you to see the rest of it being done because it's fairly rep repetitive, both for you and for me. So the next episode will be focused on something totally new, totally different. 
but I do appreciate you watching. It's a beautiful day out here, coming towards the end of January now. I feel like spring is just about coming in the air and um, yeah, spots of new little shoots, potentially bluebells and things coming up, snowdrops and the like. So really looking forward to spring now and slightly different jobs. A lot of the main hard jobs here in the woodland are done in the winter because the trees, the sap isn't flowing in the trees, they're very dormant. Uh, so you can get, you know, you've had the winter storms, you can get rid of lots of trees in terms of the ones that are damaged or dying. And you can cut the trees where you need to sustainably and they'll be able to shoot back in the spring when the sap rises and grow new shoots. So it's a great time of year. It's actually a really physical time of year, winter. Uh, but it leads into a nice spring and summer where I can start to relax a bit more and actually enjoy the woods. So, um, yeah, I do really appreciate all of you who are watching this series. Thank you so much. And um, take care, and I'll catch you in the next one.